Good afternoon, everybody. It's Brendan Baylod back again on the Inland Seas Online Shipwreck Festival. Thanks so much, everybody, who's joined us and stuck uh, with us throughout the day for uh, our uh, final afternoon talk. And uh, this is one that I'm really excited about. Uh, most of you who know me know that I'm from the Keweenaw Peninsula up in uh, northern Michigan. And uh, one of the two of the wrecks that I grew up reading about and sort of uh, hearing about and daydreaming about are the uh, uh, Hudson and the SR Kirby. And um, I actually thought about going and searching for them. And of course, I thought they were much shallower than they turned out to be. Our presenter, uh, Jerry Eliason, is one of the most prolific wreck discoverers on Lake Superior. And uh, he's been at this since I was be since before I probably could walk. Um, and uh, his his work on Lake Superior is, is really pretty legendary, and particularly these next two ships. They are two of the uh, deepest shipwrecks ever found on the Great Lakes. I'm really uh, uh, happy to have him with us. Uh, Jerry Eliason, uh, welcome, and thanks so much for agreeing to present. Okay, Brendan, hopefully that little bit of the uh, audio we had a problem with is solved, so you can hear me. Yep, I can hear you just fine, Jerry. You ready to roll? I, I'm as ready as I w will be. Yep. All righty. Uh, here you go. Uh, let me put up your slides, minimize myself, and you're on. Okay. Uh, prior to this past summer, and since last having the privilege to speak to a large number of shipwreck enthusiasts, I've been fortunate enough to be part of five wreck discoveries. Uh, the J.S. Severns and the Antelope on Lake Superior, and then the Jane Miller, J.H. Jones, and Manasu on Lake Huron. Well, in addition to these successful searches, Craig Smith and myself have made numerous trips to Ontonagon, which is kind of the east, excuse me, the west end of the Keweenaw Peninsula, searching for a wreck called the St. Clair. Well, if one includes the 150 cattle, sheep, and hogs, plus the 26 people, uh, the burning of the St. Clair off Ontonagon in 1876 resulted in by far the largest loss of life of any Lake Superior shipwreck. The only passenger to survive was the owner of the hogs and pigs. His name was John B. Sutphin. And in 1887, Mr. Sutphin became the last mayor of the village of Duluth and the very first mayor of the city of Duluth when it incorporated. So Sutphin's livestock business evolved into Elliott's Meats. Uh, and if you ever come to Gales in November or the uh, museum in Duluth near the area lift bridge uh, and stop by for some liquor at Canal Park Liquors, you'll be uh, w walking on Sutphin Street, the one block long street that was named after him. Well, searching for previously undiscovered wrecks on the lower lakes has had its pros and cons. Uh, the travel distances and logistics are a nightmare uh, on the screen. Uh, you will see one such trip of 2,400 miles by land and water. But the concentration of wrecks per square mile of bottom on the lower lakes is five times greater than Lake Superior, so the chances of success are much higher. In general, the lower lakes are also quite a bit shallower, making them easier to search than Lake Superior is. Uh, but then when you find uh, some, one, some of those wrecks in the lower lakes, those dang zebra mussels, uh, the shallower the wreck, the worse they seem to be. So this is a 120 foot deep Jane Miller coated with mussels up to a foot thick in some places. What was once the wheel is now a nearly unrecognizable glob of mussels. Well, my decision was that even though the chances of finding additional wrecks in Lake Superior was substantially less than searching the other Great Lakes, I would prefer refocusing my efforts on Lake Superior, and it's harder to find wrecks, but without zebra or quagga mussels. Craig Smith and I have been working together. Uh, we were just out the other day. Uh, this is the 40th season we're starting together. And uh, some of you may have been to some of the Gales of November, uh, Gales of November in the uh, excuse me, uh, some of the Gales in November shows uh, in November in Duluth. And some people have been to every one I found out, but uh, Craig and I have to admit that we missed the very first one in 1987. 
we were 16 miles out of Duluth searching for the Inoko, uh, the first offshore wreck we looked for uh, with this, using this inflatable boat and a paper graph fish finder. But we vowed to each other at the time that we wouldn't stop searching until we found the Inoko. But uh, we also vowed that once we found the Inoko, we would never put ourselves through the pain of looking for another wreck. Well, I'm happy to report that we took our wedding vows much more seriously. In this day and age, I should clarify that I don't mean wedding vows uh, between Craig and I. I mean, uh, Craig and his wife, Patty, they've been married continuously since 1977. Uh, Karen and I since 1973, also continuously. So this means that combined, we have been happily married for over 80 years. But, er, excuse me, let me redo the math on that. Since there's four of us involved here combined, I should say we've been happily married for almost 150 years. Well, by 2017, Craig and I had grown frustrated with the search for the previously mentioned St. Clair. And we were uncertain how much of the wreck there would be to find. We may have missed recognizing it on sonar and were reluctant to recover the already 50 square miles we had gone over. And the 120 foot long passenger coastal steamer, uh, St. Clair had burned uh, about 15 miles northeast of Ontonagon. And we were especially concerned when we read about the B.W. Arnold and Fred Stonehouse's uh, shipwreck book, the smoldering Arnold had drifted 20 miles before beaching near the Salmon Trout, Trout River. Well, maybe the St. Clair had drifted 20 miles too and really didn't sink, uh, that's always, a worry with a burnt wreck. And one of the reasons we had targeted the St. Clair in the first place was because it was historic and because Ontonagon uh, was reasonably close, uh, close to a couple hundred mile drive instead of that 2,500 mile drive. And the prime search area was in the 250 foot deep range. But what else is what else to look for? There are very few undiscovered wrecks remaining in Lake Superior that rank high in what we look for in deciding what to look for. So what factors do we go after? Well, first and foremost is a reasonably good shipwreck location information. Uh, we like to be confident that a wreck we choose to look for will be within five miles of where research tells us to start looking. Well, this still means 100 square miles of searching, and that requires about 25 good weather days of sunrise to sunset searching. Well, we also want a wreck uh, that we choose to look for to be interesting or significant in some aspect. You know, if it's a scuttled wreck and without a sinking history, uh, Craig and I have don't have a lot of interest in it. You know, on the other hand, went missing wrecks, like those included in Fred Stonehouse's book, Went Missing, are automatically high on the list, a mystery to solve with the final chapter waiting to be written once the wreck is finally located. The probable condition of the wreck is also factored into what to look for. Uh, burnt wrecks like the previously mentioned St. Clair may have little left, uh, may, very little evidence left of their existence. Uh, experience has taught us that ships carrying heavy cargoes like iron ore are much less intact than ships carrying more neutrally buoyant cargoes like grain, coal, or passengers. Well, the, the depth in the probable area of the sinking at one time played a very significant role in deciding what to look for. You know, why search for a wreck that is too deep to dive? Uh, plus, searching deep water is more difficult than shallow water. Uh, to achieve adequate sonar resolution requires getting the towfish within a couple hundred feet of the bottom, and to get the towfish close to the bottom means a longer cable and slowing down. Uh, the more cable you put out and the thicker the cable, the more drag there is. So at this juncture, but at this juncture, I actually like looking for deep wrecks now. That way they don't end up with those dive lines on them. Uh, and I wanna make a plea to everyone listening, when you're through with your, you know, having your great dives on the wreck, just don't leave those lines there, take them with you when you're done. Old dive lines on a wreck are nasty snag hazards when you're visiting a wreck. And when you're trying to visit them with a surface control camera, you're, it's just an accident waiting to happen. And divers who know me will tell you, don't get Jerry started talking about leaving subsurface dive lines on wrecks. So anyway, I had my speech on that. I, you know. 
So the fifth factor uh, in deciding what rec or recs to look for is how far are they from home? Uh, you know, the older uh, we get, the more we dislike those 20 hour, thousand mile one way drives. Uh, so in 2017, Craig and I looked at a map and took inventory of, a yet to, uh, of the yet to be located Lake Superior Rex. And except for Depp, a great place to search out it would be Eagle Harbor, Michigan, Copper Country, the Keweenaw Peninsula. Uh, with a free to use boat landing there, uh, three wrecks within a dozen miles or so, what more could one ask for? Well, maybe water not quite as deep. Uh, but after some cursory research, I contacted Fred Stonehouse, who was willing to share his most recent insights into where he thought the Kirby and Hudson might be. Uh, what Craig and I really liked is that the prime search area for the Kirby and Hudson and maybe even the Sunbeam overlapped. Now, the probable depth was really deep, though, so we began dreaming about an improved sonar system that could rel reliably detect wrecks in the 800-foot depths that were in that area. But there are 100,000 reasons not to just go out and buy one, namely dollars. Now, this chart is in fathoms, not feet, and as we found out it's really not quite accurate. It's actually deeper uh, out there than the chart indicates, uh, 137 fathoms, 825 feet. So uh, a couple years ago, the 20 year old depth finder on Craig's boat died and we needed to replace it. So in researching the best replacement, I learned that Garmin had released a reasonably priced fish finder that had an optional side view transducer using 260 kilohertz frequency. That frequency is low enough that it just had the possibility of having some long range uh, shipwreck searching applications. Now, the Garmin wasn't the first one to have side view, but it was the first one to have that frequency. Some of the other manufacturers put out higher frequency units before, but the effective range on those was so short that they really didn't have any practical application for deep water, long range shipwreck searching. So instead of spending a couple hundred dollars on a plain old fish finder, Craig and I decided to spend $800 on a Garmin 94 SV and uh, transducer. Our first trip out in 2017 was to see how that Garmin 94 SV performed on several of the deep wrecks in the Apostle Islands that we had located in previous years. Uh, and those were discoveries made along with uh, Randy Beebe and Ken Merriman. Anyway, Craig and I were both amazed uh, what we were seeing. We couldn't believe something that cheap could perform the way it did. When it was calm, the transducer even mounted simply on the transom as it was produced a decent image at a range of pro approaching its 1250 foot maximum. Now when the boat's rocking back and forth, the image was kind of fuzzy, but uh, we recognized that uh, this affordable off-the-shelf consumer grade machine had some potential. All that we needed to do is come up with a way to put the whole unit in a waterproof, pressure-proof canister and send the whole thing down as deep as we wanted, tethered to a thin stainless steel cable. So notice the price here of a thousand feet of marine grade 316 stainless steel cable, uh, 12 cents a foot. Now a thousand feet of armored sonar cable uh, runs you about $5,000. And uh, this we got a little over a hundred bucks. And the advantage of the thinner cable is that it has less drag resulting in the sensor going deeper and still being able to move the boat along at a reasonable speed. Now the smoother the towfish runs, the crisper the image is. So we decided to put a 25 foot section of bungee cord uh, between the end of the stainless steel cable and the sonar unit. And we could do this because we didn't have an electrical connection, uh, you know, to the boat, uh, just a physical connection. And this was very helpful in smoothing out wave motion when it was bouncy out. So uh, this is a sample of uh, the Russia that uh, uh, Ken Merriman and Tom Fardenquist and I uh, located last summer. Uh, this is what it looks like. And we had about three foot waves that day. And uh, this is looking at it at its maximum range at 1,250 feet. 
And the, so the resulting contraption, uh, we just started calling it Deep Diver. I'm not sure who named it, but that's what we started calling it. Uh, it's not pretty, uh, as, as you can see. And over the winter, I did create a Deep Diver Junior, which is a little bit lighter. As we, as we get older, it gets a little uh, harder to, you know, to lift out of the water. But it's often amusing uh, when we're at boat landings, fishermen will see that thing and they'll puzzle over what it exactly it is and what it's for. And then someone will say, the, do you guys build that thing? And I say, no, we found that at Menards, but they aren't cheap. So if you want one and missed it at last week's 11% off sale, I feel bad because I'm sure Menards will never have another 11% off sale. So one drawback though, uh, with the thousand dollar deep diver system, eight hundred dollars plus two hundred dollars worth of parts, uh, is uh, versus those good hundred thousand dollar commercial systems. Well, you don't get to see what deep diver sees live time, not until uh, Craig has hauled that thing, you know, back in the boat. Do we get to pull the micro SD memory chip and see what deep diver saw? But not. A bad trade-off all in all to save $99,000. Anyway, back to our search. So in August 2018, uh, Craig and I headed to Eagle Harbor to check on whether or not the bottom in the probable Kirby Sunbeam Hudson area was smooth enough to reliably search. Rugged, irregular bottoms are much more difficult to interpret than smooth featureless bottoms. And there is a rugged sawtooth reef off the Keweenaw Peninsula and we were pleasantly surprised that once you get a couple miles offshore from Sawtooth Reef, the bottom becomes virtually perfect. Uh, there's uh, just smooth nothing. So late in May, in, uh, this past year, 2019, we started our serious uh, Keweenaw searching uh, in late May and started mowing our 32 square miles of lawn. So, uh, 90% confident that if we searched all 32 square miles, we would find one wreck, uh, 50% certain of two wrecks, and maybe even a 10% chance that the Kirby, Hudson, and Sunbeam were all three within our 32 square miles. So how did we pick that 32 square miles? Well, by using the general location Fred provided and using a vintage map showing the shipping lanes used in the early 1900s. The late great, uh, shipwreck hunter who we used to run into here and there once in a while uh, told Craig and I that in the absence of contrary information search those shipping lanes if you want to find shipwrecks. Well three days of searching in marginal conditions later we were in Craig's Denali on the way home and uh, when I got around to pulling the memory card from our last days of searching on a deep diver uh, this is what we saw. Not a sure shipwreck, uh, but clearly an anomaly from the nothing but smooth bottom from our previous two days. But as Craig drove and I began the process of trying to calculate where we were when Deep Diver recorded this, I realized, Houston, we have a problem. Uh, in a hurry to get Deep Diver in the water, I hadn't waited long enough for the sonar to acquire the GPS signal and set its internal clock. Now, at any moment in time, we're running a, a system on the boat that records time and location, but we need the time to be correlated in order to correlate the locations. Well, the best I could do, since we didn't have synchronized clocks, is guesstimating that uh, this guesstimating where this target was within a half a mile or so. Anyway, we need to recover some territory, and did that a couple weeks later. Uh, now retrieving deep diver by hand is not something you do just for the fun of it. Depending on who you talk to, it weighs 40 or 50 or maybe even 60 pounds. And we weren't certain the first target was a wreck. So as long as we had deep diver in the water and suspected that Kirby and Hudson and Sunby were, were in the vicinity, we just kept going without retrieving deep diver until the end of the day. Uh, again, we're just out there visiting, napping, listening to music, watching videos, driving the boat straight and uh, depending upon or, and waiting till the end of the day to see what we accomplished. Well, we didn't succeed in reacquiring the target from the last day of that first trip of the season. 
maybe because I hadn't factored in that dang Keweenaw current, uh, that Keweenaw current at the end of a thousand foot cable gets skewed way off to one side or, or the other. It, it, it's really interesting. But anyway, for the second return trip in a row on the same stretch of road between Eagle Harbor and Houghton, we spot this target uh, in the computer process data. Well, clearly this is a very strange sonar target. It doesn't look like a shipwreck exactly, but also it doesn't look natural. And this time though, I had been careful to synchronize the deep diver and boat clock. So we knew exactly where this was. And we briefly considered turning around and uh, heading back and deploying our camera so we could see exactly what this was, you know, 820 feet down. But we decided that we just have to wait till our third Eagle Harbor trip of the season. And preferably when we could recruit a third person to help operate the camera. Well, after a few days, I got around to sharing this image via email with other shipwreck enthusiasts, including Tom Crossman. Almost instantly, Tom was on the phone telling me I should check my email. He had received this suspiciously similar cell phone screenshot image the day before from the Whitefish Bay uh, Shipwreck Museum's David Boyd. So their story was that they had returned with a better sonar to a target that they had acquired uh, the year before. And one time I heard it was the fall of 2018, they first got a hint of this location. Another time I heard it was the spring of 2018. Lastly, it was reported as the summer of 2018. But in any event, it looked like Craig and myself and the Shipwreck Museum both had the same, or both had the location of the same new wreck. And before Randy, BB, Craig, and I got back to get our camera down, the museum uh, had their ROV on it and identified the site as the SR Kirby. Well, June 29th, we were back in Eagle Harbor for trip number three and collected 15 hours of Kirby video. Uh, the Kirby is a rare composite steamer with a steel skeleton and a wood, uh, wood planking uh, that went down in a storm on May 8th, 1916. Of the Kirby's 27-man crew, there were only two survivors, plus the dog's die, the, the, the captain's dog, Ty, who was uh, floated ashore on a piece of wreckage and later returned to the captain's widow in Detroit. So it's going to take about three minutes to show you the video highlights. Uh, keep in mind that uh, what you are seeing uh, are what you're going to be seeing is the most intact and recognizable pieces of what was once the 294 foot long SR Kirby. So that was a little fluff stuff, just getting the uh, camera out of the boat. Uh, uh, what we have is a drop camera. Uh, it records high definition on the camera, but we can monitor things. Uh, I think there's one another video clip coming up, to, which will be the underwater stuff of the Kirby. There we go. So now we're on the bottom, 820 feet down in Lake Superior uh, on the SR Kirby. You know, the Kirby is essentially a two, out, uh, a two acre debris field. Uh, Randy Beebe best described the Kirby wreck site as looking like uh, a shallow water derelict that was shredded by waves and ice and then later clammed up by the Corps of Engineers as a navigation hazard loaded on a barge and dumped out in deep water. Uh, but here we are coming up on the mast, and if you got a sharp eye, you can see the bell attached to the mast there, just to the left. So it's just amazing. I'm quite confident that there are numerous World War II wrecks that were carrying munitions uh, hit by multiple torpedoes and are lying on the bottom much more intact. It, it seems obvious that that type of construction, the, the wood composite uh, was, was not uh, successful. Uh, I, I can't say with certainty how many were built. I think it was only about a half a dozen or thereabouts, but 
somehow they had a weakness uh, and then combined with the uh, heavy cargo of iron ore that it was carrying. I, I can honestly say I never dreamed that a deep water ship wreck could end up this devastated uh, and this broken apart. So I, I did use some of the photos and I, I didn't get them into this presentation on time, but I, I've been doing some 3D modeling and I was able to do, do some big sections of the wreck in 3D, but I didn't have enough continuing uh, video uh, to go from one, one spot to the other. So uh, it's still a little bit odd. Uh, the museum did send me uh, they they got a high resolution. I think they used a 900 kilohertz. Uh, you know, after after uh, on their follow up uh, trip out there, and uh, it just uh, again, uh, it, 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 when you're a kid and dream about what it would be like to visit a shipwreck, uh, this is not the the Kirby is not the wreck that you dream about uh, being able to dive on or or, or visit. Uh, some of the rocky North Shore wrecks on Lake Superior, the Madeira that have been pounded uh, are, are in much better shape than the, than the Kirby is. But in a way that makes it very interesting. We finish up on a porthole here. Okay, well now it's time. Uh, uh, oh, okay, uh, Randy then needed to head home uh, when we were through with the Kirby, uh, get back to work. And Craig and I had a couple, another day available so we resumed mowing our 32 square miles of lawn that we had set out as a goal for the season. Uh, plus we wanted to make another stab at relocating that first target of the season that we hadn't gotten back to. Recording, uh, relocating that one was proving to be more difficult uh, than anticipated, but it did teach me a lesson. So I had always been careful after that and since to get those clocks synchronized before launching Deep Diver. Anyway, time to head back home. For the third time in three trips, we are packed up and on the road home between Eagle Harbor and Houghton. When I get around to processing the deep diver collected sonar data on my laptop. Now remember, we don't see what deep diver sees live time, only when we pull the memory chip at the end of the day. Now you might be wondering why I didn't run the data before we packed up and left. Craig probably wondered that after both the first and second trips of the season. When I see this, it finally occurs to me too. But this, this time there is little doubt, we have another shipwreck and this one is intact and almost certainly the Hudson. But will we have the same situation we had with the Kirby? Uh, we know that the museum has been searching the same general part of the world. So does the museum already have this sonar target or will they find this target before we get back with, the, with our camera? Uh, so this is a portion of the uh, David Boyd's AIS track overlaid on the 32 square miles of uh, what we selected uh, to search. Well, after some thinking through this potential dilemma, I contacted Bruce at the museum and Fred, and without providing a location to Bruce, said, you know, asked them, did they have another uh, tar target up there? And Bruce said, well, you know, they had something to go back to. And, you know, friendly competition is highly motivating when it comes to shipwreck hunting, but having undisputed claim to discovering a wreck is also very special. So uh, I decided, well, Craig and I talked it over, we decided we'd set Fred the location of the, our probable Hudson target. And uh, I couldn't think of anyone else to serve as a more trusted mediator than Fred, even though I knew that he, uh, is like on the board of directors of the museum there or something, but I couldn't think of anyone else uh, and uh, Fred agreed to do it. And uh, so the thing was we sent Fred the location of our target and the museum was supposed to send Fred the location of their target. And I think it was determined that theirs 
wasn't, uh, they didn't, they, they, they just acknowledged that no, they didn't have this one eventually. And uh, anyway, thanks a lot to Fred for agreeing to be the judge and jury on this. But one of the real fun aspects of discovering a virgin wreck is that the news leads to contact with relatives of those lost on the wreck. Uh, in 2013, uh, Craig got contacted by Kathy Pletch, who was the great, great grand niece of the Henry B. Smith's captain. And uh, this time we heard from uh, Peter uh, Trotman. Peter is the great great grandson of Hudson Captain Angus McDonald. And the hope is that we get him out there. And Peter shared one of his family books and uh, came up and saw the, uh, visited us in, in Duluth. And the goal is to get him out on the wreck next, uh, this coming summer, if we're allowed back into the state of Michigan before uh, winter hits. Anyway, uh, thanks to Peter, Craig and I now have a copy of this rare book then we didn't know that existed. So uh, the name of the book is The Last Voyage of the Hudson. I'm not sure if Peter has them for, you know, actually sells them or, or not. Uh, but much of the information to follow here is borrowed from uh, this book. So the Hudson was built in 1888, a steel ship of 2,294 gross tons, measuring 288 feet by 41 feet. With a running speed of 15 miles per hour, the Hudson, when launched, was one of the fastest vessels on the lakes. Angus MacDonald became captain of the Hudson in 1894 at the tender age of 37. And this wasn't even his first command. Uh, Ten years earlier, he was promoted to master of the Vanderbilt. So you may be curious how he became captain at such a young age. Well, Angus went to work on the lakes at age 13. Uh, and uh, as a captain of the Western Transit Company, the lake arm of the New York Central Railroad, you might also be wondering who his bosses were. Well, here's a list of the officers and board of directors. I think you will recognize several of these names as captains of American industry. Uh, there's a couple of Vanderbilts on there. J.B. Rockefeller, or, or J.P. Morgan uh, Rockefeller. So loaded with 69,000 bushels of wheat, the 20 uh, and 2,000, excuse me, loaded with 69,000 bushels of wheat and 22,500 bushels of flax, the Hudson sailed through the Duluth Ship Canal on the evening of Sunday, September 15th, 1901, the intended destination of Buffalo, New York. What is known is that strong westerly winds increased to gale force overnight. As the Hudson sailed just off the Keweenaw Peninsula the next morning, he was spotted by the daughter of the Eagle River Lighthouse Keeper. Identified as the Hudson by her rare twin four and a half smokestacks, two hours later, the Hudson was no longer visible. The distance off Eagle River was variously reported as two miles and eight miles. In the days that followed, wreckage came ashore along with seven bodies of the Hudson's 24-man crew. The recovered bodies did not include Captain McDonald. Two of the bodies were a full 70 miles from where the Hudson was last seen on the surface. Eventually news came out that the John M. Nicole had witnessed some of the Hudson's struggle. The Nicole's Captain William McLean said, at 10 a.m. Monday, we caught up with the Hudson. The gale was then at its height and the seas were seen to make a clean sweep over her decks. My, my ship was leaking and in bad shape and I decided to head for Keweenaw Point and take shelter on the lee side. As we approached the Hudson, we saw that her stern was apparently gone and she was lying in the trough of the seas. Distress signals were flying and four men were seen on her deck clinging to the port rail. The cargo had apparently shifted and the boat had a bad list to starboard. It seemed to us the Hudson did not have long to remain afloat. We passed within a half a mile of her and it was hard to go on and leave those men to their fate. But our ship was leaking badly and we all had what we could do to keep her afloat. It was out, it was out of the question for us to stop. To the west I spotted another ship, I think it was the 
uh, the Gilchrist, the steel ship of larger size. We finally reached shelter under the peninsula and remained there for 48 hours. By the time we reached still water, there was three feet of water in our hold. So that's kind of the eyewitness account of uh, what, what was seen uh, when the Hudson went down. An, an investigation went on uh, and later exonerated Captain McLean from not doing more to help save the Hudson's crew. Now, one of the things I across is that there actually is a ghost story associated with the Hudson. Uh, according to the Hudson, according to legend, the Hudson rises to the surface every September 16th, the anniversary of the sinking. Captain and crew are then forced to relive the sinking as reported by a 1940s tug captain who encountered and then boarded the brown slime covered vessel. Apparitions of the Hudson's captain and helmsman identified themselves and warned the tug captain to leave immediately or experience their fate. And I kind of remember uh, a 1960s episode of the Twilight Zone with a very similar storyline. Well, Bill Reynolds uh, lives on the Keweenaw Peninsula and has become a valued friend in the past several years. Uh, without much coercion, Bill volunteered to help operate the camera when we returned, hoping to get the first ever look at the sonar target that was almost certainly the Hudson. Uh, the depth of the, the camera would be going was 825 feet. The pressure there, uh, 370 pounds per square inch. And for perspective, the tallest building in Minnesota is the IDS building, 796 feet tall. So kind of what we're trying to do there is dangle a camera off a helicopter in a strong wind trying to capture uh, imagery there. Well, for a while, all we could get on camera was a few small pieces of wreckage like you see here. And experience with a drop-down camera let us know that we were close to the hull and we saw the disturbed bottom, but getting the camera on the wreck itself at this depth is not as easy as simply positioning the boat over the wreck. Drag on the cable combined with the Keweenaw current means the camera can easily be a couple hundred feet from directly under the boat. At last, or at least that is what I kept trying to convince Bill, Craig, and myself as time passed and we hadn't seen the main hull yet. But by successive approximation, we worked our way closer. So now we're going to start a few minutes of the best video we have to date. Uh, even though we didn't get the entire name, uh, I think there is no question that this is the Hudson. We got the, the HUD. And contrary to what some thought at the time of the sinking, the Hudson did not break in two. She plunged toward the bottom bow first and appeared into the mud up to the deck at the bow. Uh, if she did capsize, as suggested at the time, she must have rolled over once or twice before she hit bottom, where she now sits upright on, and on a fairly even keel with the bow pointing to the south-southeast. Now, the stern 60 feet of the wreck is all suspended well above the bottom. Uh, from the underside of the propeller and rudder to the mud bottom is about 20 feet. Uh, the wood cabins lifted off. Uh, when she went under, but the steel hull is remarkably intact. And I apologize here for the fact that you are only seeing standard definition video and th uh, that the problem was the good old comp technology failed here, the compact flash uh, that was recording the high def and if high definition video down at the camera without the, the cable losses coming through the thousand feet of cable uh, well, anyway, so we got pictures. I, I always send out two cameras. One is taking high def video, one is taking photographs. And the, the, the card with the photographs uh, captured, all of, captured all of those, but not, the, uh, but not the high def videos. So yeah, in the months since these images were recorded on July 13th and 14th, Bill Craig and I have been on constant weather alert, hoping to make Eagle Harbor trip number five uh, we were actually going to be out there on the anniversary of the sinking date, but on the way up the caps of uh, the the uh, axle on the on Craig's uh, trailer uh, broke after I don't know how many tens of thousands of miles, but uh, so we missed that trip and then never got back out there. 
you know, and completely unlike the fall of 1987 when the weather was conducive to searching for the Anoko every weekend in September through mid-November, uh, this year there were never two good calm days in a row where we could get back to more thoroughly explore the Hudson and collect high def video. So what about that elusive target from the first Eagle Harbor trip of the season, the one that just might be the Sunbeam, the side wheel passenger ship that sank when Abraham Lincoln was president, the sole survivor, a superior Wisconsin resident who floated on a small piece of wreckage for 30 hours and survived uh, in August and only survived because he gave up his seat in one of the two overcrowded but ill-fated lifeboats. And his only nourishment was a jug of wine for 30 hours. And he was tormented by seagulls uh, the whole time and uh, was re reportedly suffered what today we would call post-traumatic stress syndrome the rest of his life. Well, hopefully the sunbeam is the, you know, the, the, we can report on that maybe next year. And like Craig likes to tell his wife, regardless of uh, whether we succeed or fail on a trip, we, we just need, we'll need to go again. And I'd like to just now thank uh, my wife, Karen, for helping me uh, put the presentation together. And I'd like to thank my son who uh, built a, a side scan sonar uh, in 1999, when he was going off to college, I said, study hard and uh, build this sonar, and he built it. And uh, until recently, it's worked reliably, and we found uh, about 15 wrecks with that one. So anyway, uh, if there's any questions, uh, let me know. Jerry, uh, thanks so much. What a great presentation. I'm going to uh, go ahead and hide this and put us both back up on the screen. All right. Pardon me. Uh, any questions uh, that anybody has from the audience for Jerry about this, uh, about these two deep wrecks or about the sunbeam, which is still missing? Some people are talking about putting a submarine down there. <laughs> Pardon me. Some people are talking about putting a, can you put a submarine down on those uh, two deep wrecks off Keweenaw? Can I? No, I, I've, uh, uh, I, I might be able to build it, but I'm not sure who would be willing to test, uh, take the test, uh, <laughs> the test dive in it. Yeah. So Jerry, are you guys going back out looking for the sunbeam this summer? Um, state of Michigan willing? It, yeah, we've been uh, trying. Uh, Living in Minnesota, we don't hear as much about what's going on in Michigan on the local news, but I I know the rules are tougher there. I tried to get a motel room uh, there, and I was just basically informed that we're not, we're not supposed to. Is that true? I mean, you're not supposed to go to Michigan. Uh, and I heard the boat landings are closed. Is that, I don't. I think they may have just opened them, although my Isle Royal trip was canceled, and I had to push back my Michigan rack hunting trip, albeit to Northern Lake, Michigan, uh, back a month uh, until early June. Can anybody on the uh, on the chat from uh, the other side of the lake confirm if the hotels and the boat launches are open? They say this week, Jerry. This week they're going to open up there. So you should be able to get up to the Keweenaw. Oh, okay. Yeah, I called last week, and uh – the nice. Uh, well, we were gonna go. We were gonna go to Ontonagon first to get all our equipment checked out uh, before heading the extra hundred miles up to Eagle Harbor, and kind of got the uh, word that May. They said call back May first. We can't promise you any anything, but call back May first. So that's so that's our plan. Yeah, we, we hope to get out there. Uh, Very cool. Well, like I say, it's been fresh. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. No, it's just been uh, fun trying to relocate that tantalizing target. But like I said, that, that Keweenaw current will skew, you know, you, you know you're driving the boat straight. And when you're going the one direction, you see that your cable pulling your towfish is skewed way off at a 30-degree angle to one side. When you come back the other way, it's still skewed 
off to that side. So then you're trying to do, you know, the trigonometry to estimate. <laughs> and again, my blunder there with not having the time. <laughs> uh, so I think with a little effort, we'll be able to find it again, but we kept getting distracted by the other targets showing up. So then you got to check those out. So, and again, the, the bad, uh, it, it wasn't a good fall uh, or, or it, it wasn't a good August, September. Um, the word is, or the experience is that right around the longest day of the year, June 21st, that, you know, if you're, ever, if you're gonna take vacation and wanna hunt for shipwrecks, I think the two weeks around surrounding that is the best. The water's still cold, so even if you're looking for shallow water wrecks, you, you don't have thermocline issues yet for the most part, uh, at least not in Lake Superior. I can't speak for the other lakes, but. Very cool. So Jerry, um... I know I was up there uh, doing some survey work with Bob Jake up in the uh, Eagle Harbor. And when we ran across you and Craig, uh, I spotted the uh, sea dory and uh, we got to learn about some of the uh, video that you had just shot. It was really an amazing weekend for not only uh, obviously for you guys, but also for Bob and I, because we had just finished shooting some pretty cool side scan imagery in the harbor. I mean, it was really cool running into you guys as, as part of that. Um, while we were up there, we spotted the David Boyd, of course, at Copper Harbor with her big, uh, you know, marine sonics on her stern. They were out looking for the minesweepers uh, just recently. Um, Jerry, any any uh, interest in those minesweepers at all? Well, uh, my interest in those uh, would be limited to if someone else found them, shared the location with me, uh, I would be, it'd be fun to go out there and put the camera on it. Uh, it a, I feel pretty happy uh, because we have this big contraption and the lights are quite a ways away. Uh, we get decent imagery. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm generally pretty ha happy with that. So that would be fun. Or if uh, they were detected magnetically like we have a couple other wrecks so that you had a place to go but i, I just see looking for those minesweepers a little bit like playing the lottery i mean i i, I did the calculations and i, I just knowing where to look uh, you know uh, following up on, you know, if a fisherman, I don't know fishermen fish out in the deep water or, or, you know, following up a net snag or something like that, I would do that. But as far as mowing the lawn, I mean, you know, you, you might get 30, 40 good search days a year. I, I don't think you can uh, find them without putting in a huge financial and time investment. So there's a few things left. Uh, I'm lucky enough but to, to now be collaborating with Tom Crossman. So he's got some added equipment and some things we can double team. And then uh, D Dan Fountain, uh, uh, we've collaborated on uh, magnetic search techniques and only about a third of the uh, wrecks in the Great Lakes show up in the magnetic because the, the flight lines that uh, we got access to be, via the Freedom of Information Act aren't spaced close enough together to, to detect but uh, uh, but if someone uh, you know if there was some kind of uh, I know Guy Meadows is one of those interested in the uh, minesweepers and I put them in touch with some people who would do custom magnetic surveys but of course those are very expensive so a, a person who limits their budget to a thousand dollar sonar system isn't going to spend 
eighty thousand dollars to fund a magnetic search. You know, I mean, I, yeah, Craig and I do things on a shoestring budget. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Jerry, we're just about up to 10 minutes here. Uh, I think we're going to uh, wrap it up because uh, we're going to start our uh, social hour in 10 minutes. And uh, I'm going to go and pour myself a, a cold beer. And uh, I'll have the uh, Zoom room link posted for those who want to join us. Don't have as many as you had at that one ghost ship festival many years ago. Oh, God, I'm still hung over from that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Jerry, thanks so much for joining us and for giving such a wonderful talk. And uh, I'm going to have all these uploaded to YouTube so people can uh, watch them and uh, you can have your own copy of it to post wherever you'd like. So thanks again, Jerry. Wonderful talk and uh, you know, a real pleasure having you on the uh, uh, at the conference today. Okay, yeah, thanks. Yeah, bye, Brendan. So long. <laughs>